Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to conduct this lecture in English. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to AESA, Armenian Engineers and Scientists of America, series of lectures. This is one such lecture. I would also like to extend our uh, gratitude to uh, Rebe Academy for hosting the lecture and specifically to to department, science department chair, Mr. John Shiraja. Uh, allow me to introduce, we, have, we are fortunate to have with us uh, an industry expert in, uh, in, the, in the topic that we're covering today, the, the 21st century production uh, product design in Armenia. Allow me to say a few words about the speaker, Mr. Randall E. Knarr. Randall E. Knarr's experience is primarily in the USA, United States of America, high technology, military, aerospace industry, having expertise initially as an engineer for military aircraft and space satellites before transitioning to middle and executive level management positions. His technical expertise includes optics, electronics, assemblies, and industrial and manufacturing engineering. He has held a variety of positions, including director of engineering and quality assurance, manufacturing project manager, and vice president of operations. He was recognized for his work promoting U.S. manufacturing initiatives to the United States Congress in the year 1994. Mr. Karnar has six United States patents and European Union patents combined for electronics manufacturing inventions. He possesses bachelor's of science and master's of science degree in physics and electrical engineering and four professional certifications that include quality assurance, business management, and lean manufacturing. He has been to Armenia 31 times since 2006 for humanitarian projects and to promote the development of high technology industry. Mr. Kanar guest lectured 29 times at American University of Armenia and appeared on Hermeg H1 Armenian National Television as an American-Armenian technologist discussing industrial development. Since 2012, Mr. Knarr is the Chief Financial Officer and Vice President of Te Technical Marketing for Global Innovations Incorporated, a Los Angeles-based high technology company working in conjunction with a Yerevan-based company in seismic sensor technology for border security, energy exploration, and medical diagnostic equipment applications. With no further ado, now I request Randall to hold on to the floor. We all enjoy this lecture. return? Yes. Okay, so we're going to do the whole thing in English. Okay, so 21st century product design in Armenia. Who's, who's, uh, who's doing the video? Slides. <laughs> I hope this works. Ah. Okay, so creating a successful organization for new product design. Uh, here's some of the issues for new enterprises. You know, they're usually cash poor, 
there's gaps in the staffing, organizational dynamics aren't good, and non-existent corporate infrastructure, limited networking, mission and goals poorly established. All right, these are all the things for a startup company or for an, a, an organization that's just getting started. We're not going to cover everything here. I'm going to assume that cash, uh, the cash is not an issue. Uh, I'm going to assume we have proper staffing. I'm going to talk about organizational dynamics, <clears throat> talk a little about corporate infrastructure, and then we'll talk about goals being defined. So some of them I'm going to cover, some of them I'm not. But these are some of the issues of a new organization. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to ask yes, questions. you can ask questions at any time. Just stop me. Can, we, can we go back to the previous uh, Oh my line. God, you're going to make me. <laughs> stop <laughs> with uh, <laughs> back and forth. I'm going to get One of our problems and the reason we invited you is gaps in proper staffing is an issue. Okay, well, I'm going to cover staffing. Uh, I'm not going to. Cover how, I'm not going to cover what do you do if you have a gap because I don't know what your what the gap is, but I will cover the staffing in detail, okay. assuming you have full staffing. Okay, so overcoming your resource limitations. The biggest thing to understand here is product design is not just about engineering. It's not just about design engineering. It's a whole team of people that have far more expertise than just engineering. Now I'm an engineer, but I understand that you gotta have very many other types of people involved so you get the whole job done properly. You gotta have a cross-functional team if you wanna design it right the first time. Just a minute. All right, now I'm gonna use automobile design when I talk about examples since everybody's familiar with an automobile. Sometimes I'm going to talk about the internal combustion engine automobiles. Sometimes I'm going to talk about Elon Musk and the new electric vehicles that Tesla is bringing out. Because these are good examples of what's been done wrong in the past and what should be done, what's being done now with Tesla and how things are moving forward. So I'll use automobiles as the example. First things first, you got to create the design path. Like, what are you designing? Why are you designing it? Who's your customer? So these are the issues here. How big of a market size do you have for that product? If the market size for your product is five units, then you probably shouldn't be wasting time designing it. It's got to be a market size that's going to bring you returns on your investment. <laughs> performance requirements. You got to know what, what are the requirements for the performance of what the product is that you intend to design. So if it's an automobile, you want to know how fast it is, does it have to accelerate? What is its handling characteristics? Those kinds of things. Technical specifications. The performance requirements drives your technical specifications because once you say I want to drive that car from 0 to 60 miles an hour in 5 seconds then you have to have the technical specifications that will meet that requirement. Product cost requirements. You should never design a product unless you know how much you can sell it for and what is your cost target to make it and how much profit do you expect. So you have to have all that data. Manufacturing plan. Uh -huh. Goes too fast. Yeah. Manufacturing plan. You, when you're designing something, you want to make sure that as you're designing it, you have a plan as to how you're going to manufacture it. If you design something with no plan during the design phase to manufacture it, it's going to be a disaster. You'll end up designing something that cannot be manufactured. Uh, efficiently or effectively or you're not going to be able to manufacture it at all and I've seen that where things just can't get made because the design was impossible okay and then initial cost well, that's pretty self-explanatory the cost of what the product is at the time you buy it and then life cycle costs 
is how much is that product going to cost you as you own it? How long are you planning on owning it? If you own a Mercedes, it's going to have high life cycle costs. If you have a Toyota Corolla, you're going to have much lower life cycle costs. So that has to be understood as you're designing. Environmental requirements. Is this, is this going into space? Is it going underwater? Is it going deep into the ground? If you were a, uh, working in the energy exploration industry and you've got an oil well 10,000 feet deep, all these things have to be designed in because you've got temperature and pressure and humidity. And if it's, if it's on the ocean, you have salt fog requirements. I didn't understand that. That's awesome. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> Test requirements. Once you've established all of the requirements for, for your product, whether it's performance requirements, environmental requirements, whatever it happens to be, you've got to be testing. You've got to be testing as you're designing. You don't want to wait and test the final product. You want to be testing sub-assemblies as you progress forward. And then when you test the final assembly, the final product, you got some assurance that it's going to work pretty well. You don't want to wait until you got the final product before you begin testing. Quality assurance requirements. <clears throat> There's a lot here in terms of quality assurance. You want to make sure that things are being done the way they should be done. Are things being done, well, first of all, are things being documented? If you're not documenting uh, your work, it's going to be chaotic. So quality assurance, that's part of what quality assurance does. Abilities. Nobody's probably ever heard of that, but they use it in the military. Um, <clears throat> producibility, maintainability, repairability, reliability. And this is mean time between failures. How often does something break down? Compatibility. All right, so let's go through them. Producibility. How easy is it to manufacture your product? When you design it, you got to think about that when you're designing it. You can't wait until after the design is done and then decide how or think about how am I going to manufacture this. It's got to be part of your design. Maintainability. It's got to be part of the design. How many people have gone to the car repair shop and they, to fix the water pump, they got to take half the engine apart to get to it? That's a bad design. You shouldn't have to take half of your car engine apart to get to the water pump to make that replacement. So maintainability is an issue. Repairability. How hard is something to repair? Now when you do the water pump, it's just remove it and replace it. But what if there's something that actually has to be disassembled and repaired? So that's repairability. Is it easy to take apart? Is it easy to reassemble? Does it need uh, some kind of adjustment? Because sometimes adjustments are very difficult if it's not planned out. So repairability is ease of repair. Reliability, how often does it break down? That's it. Mean time between failures. How much time passes before there's a failure? Compatibility, backward and forward. What that means is when you have your first product, you have an automobile. It's coming out for the first time. It's a brand new design. And then over a period of years, you redesign it. When you redesign it, you don't redesign everything, usually. You're redesigning portions of it. When, when that new design needs repair, can you use some of the older parts from the original design in the new design for the repair? So, and then, so that's where you call it backward and forward compatible. This is not a, a real big deal in the auto industry, but it's a very big deal in military equipment because military equipment usually has a lifespan of 30 years or more. The B-52 bomber came out in 1953. We're still flying them in the Air Force. And they're planning on flying the B-52 for the ne another 30 or 40 years. It's going to be a 100-year-old bomber by the time it's done. And because they pay attention to backward and forward compatibility, they can keep making that plane better, and yet everything still works, and they can rely on 
the backward and forward compatibility issues because they take that into account when they're doing the redesigns. Go ahead. All right. Hello. Sorry. All right, now I'm going to define each position for the integrated design. And this is the, the various people that are going to be in a product design team. Okay, I'm going to go through them quickly here, and then I'm going to go through each one of these in more detail as we progress through. So, here's a, a, a good design team has motivated individuals, and they got to be sharp. They got to have talent. Now, I don't know how much you follow Tesla and Elon Musk, but he hires the best engineers for SpaceX. He hires the best engineers for Tesla. And he's got people who are motivated and, and they work long hours and they work hard to make things happen quickly and to get the job done. Program manager with mentor. All right, so again, I'm going to go through these fast. What, I'm, what I mean here with a mentor, anytime you have a program manager, it's a good idea to have somebody that's not on the design team that kind of can step back and look at what's going on with the design team and give feedback to the program manager. So it's usually, it's usually someone with a lot of experience, somebody that's quite capable in giving good advice to the program manager. Technical marketing, we talked about this earlier when we said what is the target market, what's the product. That's what this, this either person or group of people will do, is technical marketing, defining your product. Then we have systems engineering, which is looking at the whole product. All right, for an automobile, you have a group of people designing the engine. You have a group of people designing the transmission and everything else, the interior, the wheels, the body, the whole structure of the vehicle. If that's not coordinated with the systems engineer, it'll be chaos. What if you're designing a top-level Mercedes and the person designing the engine thinks it's going to be a four-cylinder economy car and builds it and designs a tiny engine for a, a full-size Mercedes. See, that's chaos. That means this, there was no systems engineer, there was no definition of the requirements of what the engine transmission should be so that when you put everything together, it makes sense. If you're going to have a Mercedes, you're not going to have a tiny little four-cylinder engine in, in a full-size Mercedes. And the same with the transmission. They have to be matched and balanced. Those specifications and that coordination of the different engineering groups in the design phase has got to be done with a strong end systems engineering team. You can't just have different engineers working on different parts of the car and not coordinate their effort because it won't come out right. It's guaranteed to be a failure. Project engineer, uh, we'll go through that too in more detail later, but a project engineer is supporting the effort of the different uh, design teams working in conjunction with the systems engineer. Producibility and manufacturing engineering is exactly what it is. They're working with the design engineers so that as a design comes out, they're looking as they're designing it, not afterward, during the design, to make sure that it can be built and there is machinery available to build it as they plan. Go ahead. Industrial and safety engineering. When you're designing your product, you've got to take a look at these things early. Industrial engineering has to do with laying out the factory, making sure all the equipment is going to fit, and also the combination of humans working with the equipment. So there's human factors engineering involved. Safety engineering is exactly that. You want to make sure that whatever you design, you're going to have it in a factory. The factory's got to be safe. You don't want people getting injured. Quality assurance, well, we covered that already, but we'll go into more detail later. Human resources and training, you got to hire the right people for your factory. You got to make sure they're properly trained. You got to plan that during the design phase because human resources needs to know during the design phase what kind of people they have to start looking for 
so that they can begin the interview process. You don't do that after the design is done. It's too late. But when the design is done, you want to start manufacturing it. If you don't have the people and they're not trained, you're wasting time. Supply chain, everybody knows about that. You go at the Home Depot and all you know, the shelves are empty. Supply chain means that when you're designing your product, you got to know who is going to make which parts or sub-assemblies. You have to plan that out during design. You don't design it, and then when the design is done, start looking for companies to either procure parts or assemblies. It's too late. You do it during the design. Production control, that's during production you want to uh, uh, there's people involved that are making sure that the parts are coming to the production line. This one can be done later in the design because this is more towards manufacturing, but you want to make sure production control has to make sure, along with industrial engineering, how do we make sure we can keep bringing parts and assemblies to the production line smoothly so we have a smooth running assembly line. Configuration control means when you have all the drawings for your product, the drawings that tell you exactly how to make every part, every sub-assembly, and how to put everything together. You might have drawings with 20, 30, 40 different revisions. Rev A, Rev revision B, revision C, revision D. If there's not somebody controlling those revisions, one person or one organization, then the engine designers are working to revision D, and then the people working on the transmissions are working on revision G, and, they, and then when they put the engine transmission together, they don't, it doesn't work, because everybody's working to a different set of drawings. One That's a disaster. That. Does that get addressed during integration and test? Part of it does, yes. Mm -hmm. But it should always be controlled from day one of the design team. Because you can't have, you gotta make sure that, the, that when you do a new revision to a drawing that everybody knows about it. You can't have people using old drawings for the design. And then finance. There's no getting around it, you gotta have money. I have a question for you. Looking at, looking at practicality, right? Uh, what is really happening in the world? For example, in our little company that you have visited, right? So there's a top drawing that calls it Rev A. Right. Right? And the top drawing has Rev A. Or the final Rev, Rev F. And in between, there are lots of other drawings for some assemblies. Right. And they have different revisions. Right. Okay, so F does not necessarily mean that everybody else in that list right. also has to carry the letter F. Right. They could carry letter D, E, C, and so on. But it has to be the latest revision for that, that sub-assembly or for that part. Yes. Yeah. So um, I, I really haven't figured out how, but somehow you need to relate F to the rest of it, like like in a locked mechanism that you know. Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That F, F must, must use A, C, G, H, I, and D. Well, the, the, way, the way you handle that is you, you, you just, whatever the next rep is, that rep you have to go and look for. So it must reference, every drawing must reference the very top drawing. Right. Right? That's right. It's talking about dependencies, isn't it? That's right. So there's a dependency section. This yes. rep requires blah, 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 blah. That's right. Good. John? John? <laughs> okay, so now we're going to go in detail for each one of these. For the program manager, overall responsibility, customer satisfaction, product design, product cost, quality, and schedule. The three main things, cost, quality, schedule. And people say you can only have two out of the three, right? It's really not true. There's, if, if you do a good job, you'll get all three. And the reason you will get all three is if you have poor quality, your costs go up. If you have poor quality, chances are you've got problems on your production line, which means you don't deliver on time. 
But if you have good quality, chances are you're going to not have schedule problems because you're not shutting down your factory. And your costs will be lower because you're not shutting down your factory. So the three of them go together if it's done right. If you're doing it as a team, which I'm calling here the, the a team of people, not just engineers working alone, but working with the other people within the organization, as we've discussed. When you do that, you can drive your costs down, improve your quality, and maintain your schedule. Leads cross-functional teams and assures all teams work to one overall design criteria. All right, this is what we're talking about. Part of it is making sure that they're working for the right drawings. Part of it is making sure they're working to the marketing requirements, which flows down through systems engineering to the technical performance requirements. So if everybody's working to the right requirements, you'll have less problems downstream. The program manager also leads the periodic design reviews. Now, let's say you have a two-year development time for a new product. You're not going to just keep designing and designing for two years. You're going to have design reviews in there. It's, called, it's like kind of like recess when you go to school. After two or three months, you're going to take a break. Everybody's going to evaluate where, they're, where they are. You have a big meeting, and everybody comes up and prevent, presents. So uh, for an automobile, the engine designer comes up and says, this is what our engine design is looking like, and we're progressing. And then the transmission, then the people building the, the, the interior, or the people building the body. Everybody's going to come up and give a presentation. That's a design review. And the other people in the design review will say, wait a minute, you can't design that engine that way because our transmission design won't work with it. That's a good design review because you want to catch those errors early. And that's why it's good to have design reviews frequently to catch those kinds of problems that get through the cracks. Now, your systems engineer is also responsible for making sure those things happen. But even with good systems engineering, it still happens. But it should happen less, and the severity of the problem should be less because you have good systems engineering. You don't want to have massive problems after you've been designing for six months. You want the problems to be small so that they're easily fixed. Meets with the customer. Program manager should be meeting with the customer and keeping the customer informed, including when there's problems. The program manager should not always go to the customer and just say all the good things without telling what some of the problems are. Now, there's two reasons for that. One is you want to be open, honest, transparent, because that's how you gain trust with your customer. The other reason you want to do it is sometimes the customer's requirement is not realistic and you have to evaluate it. The program manager needs to evaluate those unrealistic customer requirements based on the design reviews. Because it might come out in the design review that you can't meet the customer's requirements at all in certain areas. In which case, you're going to have to go back to the customer and say, this is where we're at, this is the problem, and this is how we think we can resolve it, but it's going to require you as the customer to give us a little bit of leeway. And if you work closely with your customer all the time, you can get that kind of leeway with them. Now, I worked on a space satellite program where everybody was having, we had 22 people in a meeting, and they were having problems for three years on a, an electronic assembly for the satellite. And this was going to hang up production of the satellite after three years of not producing it. Everybody said, we can't change the specifications for the satellite. We have to build it per the satellite specification. I ended up finding out that the specification was wrong. It was actually wrong. It was a mistake made by one of the engineers. Everybody said you'll never be able to change it because when, when you try to change a satellite specification, it's, it's like an act of God. But when I went through and documented the reason why and showed that this is a mistake, 
it's not like we're just asking for a change. We're asking to fix the mistake in the original design. It got approved within three months, we move forward. That's very important that these design re reviews happen, meeting with the customer so that you can get those changes made. Reports to corporate management. Now, and depending on how big that organization is, if it's a small company, the program manager might be the CEO of the company. If it's a big organization, if, and if the program manager is working with a big design team, you know, like 300 people, 500 people on a design team, that program manager may occasionally go see corporate management and have to tell them what's happening. And it's the same thing. When you go see corporate management, that's the same as going to your customer. You gotta be honest with them and open, and if there's something wrong and you need more money to fix it, it's better to tell your corporate management, give me more money now while the problem is small, rather than waiting until the design is done and it doesn't work, and then you got a big problem going back to do the redesign. So corporate management and customer, you treat them the same way, and you'll get good results that way. Corporate management will give you the money if they trust your judgment and they know you're telling them the truth about what's happening, even if it's bad news. Better to do it early, fix it early, it'll cost less. And the mentor. The mentor should be somebody who's a very experienced program management program manager who probably wants to retire and does this as a mentor to the program manager who's running the program. You want somebody with a lot of experience guiding the current program manager because the program manager position, especially for a big program, you know, if you get over 100 people, it becomes a huge job because you kind of like, it's like a sheep herder. You have to make sure everybody's following in the right direction. And to do that, it's uh, emotionally distressing. It's, it's very stressful. It's an emotional downer sometimes when there's a lot of problems going on all at once. And it's good to have a mentor to keep the sanity of the program manager. It sounds funny, but it's important that you consider having a mentor for the program manager and to look at things from the outside. Okay, technical marketing. Target, identify target market. Okay, we talked about this earlier. You wanna make sure that, that whatever product that you wanna bring out, you know who the market is for that. You, the technical marketing leads the effort to define and document customer needs and wants. So you gotta have people going out and interviewing the customer, whoever that customer is. You gotta interview them. Now, when I worked in military aerospace, our people would go to the US military. they talked talk to uh, high-ranking officers, and then they would go talk to foot soldiers. You want to know what the sergeants think. Because in the Army, the sergeants really run the Army. People think the high-ranking officers are running the Army. It's the sergeants who are moving the privates forward. So the sergeants have a lot to say because it's very important that they have the equipment they need to get the job done out in the field. So you have to figure out who that is. When you're in more technical marketing, you have to figure out who is my customer, ultimately. The ultimate customer. There's one person who pays for it, but the person paying for it, like military equipment, is paid for by the US taxpayer. But who's actually using it? The foot soldiers, the sergeants, the pilots using the aircraft. So you need to have a good understanding of the customer needs. I'm going to give you an example. We were working on that infrared unit for the Abrams main battle tank, which is the tank that's currently used by the U.S. Army. And the infrared unit, which allows you to see at night. So you're looking in a little television screen this big. And it's in a box like this. And the box is right about here, and when you're seated, you're looking at it. Well, in order to get from that person, that crewman's seat out of the tank, it wasn't convenient to, where there was a foot pedal to climb up to get out of the tank, wasn't conveniently placed. So guess what they used for their little footstep 
to get out of the tank. They used the top of this infrared system. <coughs> now all of a sudden the, the unit goes out in the field and, and all these units are coming back and they're broken. We go, how are they breaking? <laughs> Nobody knew how they were breaking because the army just sends them back and they said it's broken, it's no good. And our people are saying, how did the how did the chassis, the box, get broken when it just sits there? So somebody from our company had to go out to the army. The officers didn't know why, because the officers aren't in the tank. They had to go down to the sergeants, the tank sergeants, and then to the privates in the tank. And they go, well, how did this break? Oh, well, when we come in and out of the tank, it's not convenient where the little step piece is to put our foot down. It's more convenient to use the top of the box. And of course, when they're jumping down in there, that box wasn't designed for that, and they were starting to have problems. So you have to know your customer. I mean, you really have to know your customer. You have to know how they're going to use it, not how you think they're going to use it, but how are they really using it. So these are very important issues. Okay, uh, technical, you know, not just the program manager keeps uh, contact with the customer. Also, technical marketing, that's as I just explained to you. Uh, technical marketing may or may not talk to corporate management. That's more of the program manager's job. But it can happen. It can still happen. None of these are set in stone. Develops new customer relationships. Now, when, when the marketing guy goes back and finds out why the infrared unit in the tank was breaking, that's another opportunity to talk to the soldiers and the sergeants and the officers to find out what other equipment they need. Because that could be another future product for your company. So the technical marketing person shouldn't just go back to, to find out why something broke, but to see if they can bring in new business. Always try to make it uh, another potential business for you. Determines applications for current product. All right, now, you have that infrared unit. It doesn't have to go in just a tank. Maybe it could be modified, which we did, and it went into the C-130 cargo airplane. So you want to be able to take that same product and see how many other places can you use it. That's part of technical marketing's job. And then identify new products. Well, I just talked about that. You go back, you see the people, ask them what other new products they want. You should also be identifying your competitors. Not just your, the companies who are your competitors, but the products that they have that might be a competitor for you. And then networking with other individuals, companies, and organizations. All right, I'm gonna give you a brief example. On November 10th, I had the opportunity to meet the former head of NASA from, from the Trump administration. <coughs> So this gentleman invited me to meet him. I had to go to Beverly Hills. I met him in the hotel. I talked with him for 45 minutes. And in just 45 minutes, I, I must have impressed him enough because he invited me to dinner that he was having that night for, with, for 19 other companies. So that night I drove to Beverly Hills and I meet with these people for a dinner meeting. Now we had a problem with our product and I was struggling, and it was my job to figure out how to solve that problem, and I had been struggling with it for four years. I go to this meeting, and everybody had to give a two-minute presentation on what they do. So when one of the gentlemen stands up just a few feet from me, and he stands up and he starts describing his company and the product they make, and I go, oh my God, that's the solution to my problem. And I ended up meeting him later that evening, and I talked to him, Yesterday morning, I'm going to go eventually visit the company. So this is a big deal. You got to go and network. You got to go see people. You got to talk to them. It's a good way to solve your problems, and it's a good way to find new business. Go ahead. Systems engineering. Well, we talked about this. I'll go through this fast. You got to define and document your system level design. All right. Now for an automobile, you're designing a full-size Mercedes. The systems engineer takes the marketing requirements. It's got to be a luxurious car. The marketing is more of a 
qualitative description, flowery words. It's got to be very ultra luxury. It's got to be fast. Right. Well, when you tell an engineer it has to be fast, that doesn't help the engineer design the product. Tell him what does the zero to 60 time have to be? That's what he needs to do. Or she. He or she. <laughs> okay, we, we have some women in here, so I, we gotta, I shouldn't be using he. Anyway, uh, so you gotta have the systems engineer takes the marketing definitions for what the product should be and converts that into mathematical language so that the engineers can take that and start designing. If they say the car has to weigh less than 4,600 pounds, the engine has to be around six liters in displacement, it's got to have an eight-speed transmission, then the engineers know where they have to start from. Right, so that's what this is all about, defining and documenting the system level. Environmental and test specifications. You got to be doing your testing as you're doing your design so you don't have that failure when you get to the end of the design. So all this has to be written down. The US military has a handbook for test specifications. Anybody want to guess how many pages that handbook is? It's about 1,280 pages the last time I looked at it, which was several years ago. And it's got everything you can imagine. In it. You know, when you think about, here's another example, when you think about an aircraft carrier, you're on the ocean, you got salt fog, because the ocean is, got, has salt water. So when there's spray, there's salt. And salt makes things rust fast. You can have a brand new computer, open it up on a ship, and in 48 hours, you will begin to have electronic failures. The rust, in 48 hours, the rust will start working on it. That's why on electronics for Navy ships, naval ships, the electronics have to have special coatings on all the electronics. And those coatings prevent the destruction of the electronics, the circuit card assemblies. Now I've worked on many of those, and in fact, when you mentioned my patents, some of my patents have to do with how do you pr uh, protect electronics with specialized coatings. Now, you put those coatings on there because you're trying to protect the electronics. You gotta make sure that you have the right environmental requirements because what if you don't specify that this is gonna be going on a naval ship? If you don't specify that, and if you don't say it has to meet salt fog requirements, it has to survive the environment of the ocean. Or on an on a aircraft carrier, you have a lot of hydraulic fluid because of all the aircraft. And the hydraulic fluid is in the atmosphere. There's no way they can prevent it. It gets into the atmosphere. And that is also very destructive for electronics. So these things have to be defined and then you have to have test requirements and you have to do your testing to make sure that this thing will survive when the product is done. And then this must accommodate manufacturing needs. You gotta have your definition of how it's going to eventually be built. You know, how big of a factory do you need? How, how fast does production have to be? All these things at least an approximation. You know, if you're designing something where you're only going to build 100 cars a year, that's a totally different factory than if you're building 100,000 cars a year. So you have to have at least an order of magnitude definition so that the engineers know, I can't spend $50 million on robots if I'm only building two cars a week. The robots will never pay back. So these, these are the kinds of things you have to think about. Now, the systems engineer also has to overcome conflicting technical challenges. Now, we talked about that earlier. When that transmission and that engine don't match up because they designed them differently than what the spec called for, or maybe the spec was wrong, then the systems engineer has to go back and work with both the, engineer, the engine engineers and the transmission engineers to figure out how are we gonna make this thing work? How are we gonna fix the problem? because that systems engineer has to worry about the whole car. 
and the engine and transmission is part of that, so that has to be able, that, that solution to the engine transmission problem has to be meshed in with how the whole car performs. Supports the relationship with the customer. Yeah, the program manager sometimes has to take the systems engineer with he or she so that when you're talking to the customer or if you're talking to your corporate management, you're going to have to have an expert. This is your expert. The program manager may not be an expert in the details of the engineering design, so the systems engineer would go with the program manager and then support the information that's being told to the customer. Go ahead. Go ahead. Project engineer. When, you're, when you have all these different groups working on building your car, engine, transmission, axles, body, whatever, you have to have a project schedule. Most of you probably have heard of Microsoft Project, and you don't necessarily have to use Microsoft Project. When I did it, Microsoft Project was too complex if you're working on a relatively small project. So if you're working on a small one, I would just use a spreadsheet. But I had a schedule. And everybody knew what the schedule was. All the different groups knew what their schedule was. And if there was a problem somewhere, then you got to go back and fix that problem so that you maintain the schedule. Because if the, if the engine designers get way behind, then no matter what, if you, if you finish the rest of the car design, you, you're not done yet until the engine design is done. So you got to have everybody working to a schedule, and they got to all meet the schedule, or you're never going to finish. You have to have a statement of work for each task, and that's part of how you meet your schedule. You give them statements of work. Now, the project engineer doesn't invent the statements of work. The project engineer works with the various organizations so that everybody agrees on what the statement of work should be for each task. And then from, the, from each task, you determine the labor hours for each task. And these are estimates. Engineers are notoriously bad at estimating the time. It's usually three to six times more labor than what they'll tell you. Now, I worked as a project engineer, and whenever some, and then when I'd ask an engineer how much time you think for that job, and they'd say, oh, 100 hours. In my mind, I'm thinking 300 to 600 hours is the real answer. Is there, is there an escalating, is there some kind of curve Cross mechanical electrical software? They're all wrong. <laughs> right, but They're, which one's more wrong? Than most and, of them. and I'm <laughs> an engineer too, and I've made the mistake. But what I do when I do it is I think about, okay, how, how long? And then after I come up with my answer, then I multiply my answer by three or five. <clears throat> okay, and then you roll up the totals. So when you roll up the totals, now the project engineer can go report to the program manager and the systems engineer. How big of a job is this now? Because the systems engineer and program manager aren't going to know until these tasks are done. They won't know how big it is either. So this person has to go talk to all the different engineering groups and, and get, we hope, reasonable estimates, and then even triple them if necessary, so that you can get some kind of feel for what it's going to take to do this job. Now, conduct line of balance analysis. Are you, People, anybody here familiar with line of balance? Right, this became a big deal during World War II in, in the United States. Everybody within the country is rushing to build military equipment for, for the war effort during World War II. And it does no good to have the big engines of a ship be built, but the ship, and the, and the, you build the engines in two months, but building the ship takes a year. So when do you start building the engines? At the beginning? No, if it takes a year to build a ship, maybe you're gonna wait until month nine or month 10 and then build the engine so that they all finish at the same time. Now, why do you wanna do that? Well, you don't wanna build something and then let it sit there for eight or 10 months. Number one, it's gonna deteriorate. Number two, where are you gonna keep it? Maybe it gets lost, maybe it gets stolen, maybe it gets damaged. And think about it, during a war effort, every day there's fighting going on. You don't want to build something now and it's not going to get used for 10 months. You're better off building something that the troops need right now. The war goes on day by day. 
So you want everything balanced. When you're designing your car, the engine, transmission, everything should all come together, including all the purchased parts, because you're not going to make everything, you're going to purchase a lot of your parts. They should all come together at the same time. So that's line of balance. And that's a big job, because if you're talking about a car, and there might be 500 sub-assemblies, two or 3,000 individual parts, you got to make sure that every one of them, the schedule, meets the final schedule to put everything together. So this is a big job, and, and the project engineer will probably get the help of industrial and, man, industrial and manufacturing engineers to get the line of balance analysis done, because that's not something just one person can do. It takes some skill levels from several different people. The project engineer monitors the schedule and tells the PM when the program manager, when delays occur. This, when I say program manager, I'm including the whole design team. Everybody needs to know. Systems engineer, everybody. The delays will kill your project. The costs will go up, you'll fall behind schedule, it'll be a disaster. So this is a big deal to know when delays occurring and that comes from here and that comes from knowing this. Now the project engineer is maintaining and posting a variety of metrics and the project engineer might be working very closely with quality assurance because quality assurance also gets uh, is responsible for providing a lot of metrics. Well what's a metric? Something you're measuring to see whether you're on time or not. If you have a hundred day project to design your engine. So at 50 days, you should be half done. But if at day 50, you estimate that I've only got 20% of the work done in the first 50 days, you're behind schedule. You got a delay. You're not gonna, it's pretty hard to catch up if you're that far behind. So that's the metrics. Somebody's gotta be measuring, are you making it as you go along? Now, the best, the easiest way to talk about a metric is you go to a track meet. What are they doing? They're, every time a race is run, or every time a shot put is thrown, or a javelin is thrown, they're measuring it. That's a metric. And all it is is talking about, are you measuring the things that are important? Now, in big companies especially, they end up measuring things that aren't important. It's just out of stupidity. I mean, that's the easiest way to explain it. You want to make sure that whatever you're measuring is important and helps the organization get the job done. So don't measure something that isn't important. Okay, uh, lead small tiger teams to resolve unforeseen challenges. Now, sometimes you've got the transmission people, you've got the engine people, there's a problem between them, but it's not a big problem but it's a problem that needs to be resolved. Sometimes the two groups will tell the project engineer, can you handle it, whatever it happens to be. Sometimes the project manager or project engineer sometimes fills in in between these organizations and helps, kind of like glue, right? You put two pieces of wood together with glue. So the project engineer sometimes will work in that direction. Next. Design engineers. Okay, well here's a bunch of different design engineers. Now this happened to me because I happened to be a project manager on one project. I had a, an optical engineer, a, manu uh, a manufacturing engineer, a software engineer, an electronics analog engineer, and an electronics digital engineer, and we had a problem. So we're sitting in a round table, six of us, meeting goes on, I timed it. Metrics. 43 minutes. We had a one hour meeting. 43 minutes go by and everybody's blaming the other one. The optical engineer says, no, the problem's in the electronics, analog electronics. The analog electronics guy is saying, no, it's in the digital electronics is the problem. They're all finger pointing. And I'm sitting there listening to this. 43 minutes. This is my meeting. I'm the project manager. We don't have a solution. And then finally, one of the engineers says something. Uh, and actually, one of the engineers asked the other engineer a question, and the other engineer didn't answer it. But they didn't say anything. 
the, the whole group just sat there. You know what asymptotic curves are? They asked the question and the answer, and it went like this. They never, the, the question never got answered properly. So I'm listening to this, and I go, wait a minute. You asked this question, but your answer didn't address his question. I want you to answer his question directly. And when he answered, and this time there was no women in the group, when he answered his question, they figured out the problem. It was all about communication. It's like me. I, I know a little bit of Western Armenian. I know a little bit of Eastern Armenian. I don't know enough Armenian, and sometimes there's problem. I'm in the, this is a true story. I'm in the taxi 50 miles outside of Yerevan, and I'm calling the taxi, and I'm, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, I'm calling him a vort, right? For, for the driver. Varor, the driver. But I'm saying vort because I don't know any better. <laughs> so I find out later on I'm calling him a worm. I didn't even know. Then I found out, I apologized to him, but he, he didn't care, but I apologized to him. This is what happens when you have different engineering disciplines. They don't understand each other because the mechanical engineer has his own language. The electrical engineers, the, the, design, the digital designers have their own language, the analog designers have their own language, the optical engineers have their own language. Fortunately for me, I had taken enough classes in enough of those areas where I could kind of fill in the blanks or at least make them speak properly to each other so they, so they would understand each other. So it's kind of like a translator. Sometimes the, the project engineer has to be the translator for all the different languages that are spoke here. Now I guarantee you, I've talked to aeronautical engineers and they can start telling me stuff and I, I don't even know what they're talking about. You know, that's, that's how it can become. And it can, be, it can happen in any of these fields. All right, you gotta work as a team to meet the objectives of the system level design criteria. The one thing that happens frequently in, in a design team, the engine designers go, look, this is our engine design, and if the transmission can't meet and work properly with our engine design, then transmission designers, it's your problem. That's wrong. It's not your problem. <coughs> if, if that product doesn't get finished, then it's the problem for everybody. You can't just dump the problem onto somebody else on your team. So it's got to be a team effort. If that engine design doesn't work with the transmission design, they have to both go together and solve it together with the systems engineer, the project engineer, the manufacturer. They all got to get involved and solve it. You can't just dump it on the other group and say it's your problem. Okay, the team includes other disciplines outside of design engineering, refer to slides five and six, so that'll be further down. Product design is responsible for 80% of product costs and quality. This is, this is actually a real number. It's 70 or 80% of your final product cost is determined in design, product design. That means the designers control everything that happens downstream. So when you're in manufacturing, you're manufacturing that vehicle and, and people aren't buying it, the customers don't want it because it's too expensive, that means the design team didn't do their job right. Because if they had done their job right, they would have designed it so it would have hit the cost target so that your customer would want to buy it. So this, this number is real. Okay, last one. Provide complete production drawing package, create, uh, provide. All right, you have to have a complete production drawing package before you go to manufacturing. And this is what we talked about earlier. We talked about production control, document control, quality assurance. Those are the organizations that are worried about are the drawings to the right revision level do you have all the right revisions for all the drawings? Are all the drawings made, uh, created properly? And I think I have a slide where we're going to talk about that in quality assurance. 
you got to make sure all your engineers are trained to draw the drawings per a standard. We'll talk about that later. And then create a bill of material. Now, a bill of material is all of the line items to build a product. So if you have a car, you might have 5,000 line items for your bill of material. It's going to be thousands. <clears throat> By the way, this, ha this almost, well, this did happen. On August 8, 1988, that's 8888, that's why I remember it. I had to fly with two other engineers from, from the company I worked, and we flew to Chicago to go visit a supplier that was making some high technology optics for us. And we're, on, we're getting on the plane, we're in the airport, we're talking about the bill of material. Uh, what's, what's the acronym for bill of material? Uh, uh, and we were talking about the bill of material for an anti-tank air-to-ground missile. So we're talking about a bomb for the Maverick missile. So we're, we're, we're in the airport, in the building, and, and we're saying bomb, bomb, and I go, you know what, we need to stop saying this word in here. That's <laughs> for the obvious reasons. That really happened, and, and then everybody quieted down and we got on the plane without any incidents, but that, that could have been a big deal. And you don't, if you're in security and you're talking about a bill of material, don't use that acronym. <laughs> okay, next. <clears throat> All right, producibility and manufacturing engineering. Now, I also worked in this area for a while. They work with the design engineers during the design, not after the design is done. I, I keep harping on this because this, this happens in many companies. They bring in the, the producibility and manufacturing engineers when the design is done. They go, here, now you figure out how to manufacture it. That is the wrong thing to do. You want to have your manufacturing engineers and your producibility engineers and your industrial engineers, which I'm going to talk about later. You want those engineers in the design, on the design team. They're there from the very beginning. Because if you design something, you better know how it's going to be made as you're designing it. And if you don't know how it's made, then you shouldn't be designing it. That should be the criteria, and it isn't. You get a lot of designers and they go, well, I don't know how it's going to be made. That's the manufacturing engineer's problem. No, it's your problem because you're the designer. You have to know how it's going to be made. You better go find out all the different ways you can make it. So if it's a metal part, it could be stamped. It could be an injection. Uh, well, plastic is injection mode. So a metal part could be stamped, uh, or it could be machined. You gotta know which one it's gonna be because it affects cost, it affects quality. There's a lot of issues involved. You've got to know how you're going to manufacture it as you're designing it. And these people will help. They have to be on the team. And then you'll hit your target costs and quality levels if it's done right. I have a question about that. Is that the difference between waterfall and agile design? Is that the inflection point between those two design philosophies? Agile design? Agile versus yeah. waterfall, where you just yeah. throw it over the fence? Well, yeah. yeah. Well, we don't call it waterfall, but yeah, sure. I'm throwing it over the fence. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to talk about those issues as we move through here. All right, now, producibility and manufacturing engineering, as soon as the design team agrees on how something's going to be manufactured, then these people go to work to figure out how much production floor space is the machine going to need. How many people have to work there? You have to know those things because you got to know how big your factory is going to be. How much is the machine going to cost? I better go talk to finance. We have to get approval for a, $10 to $20 million machine. All right, so now I'm going to talk about Tesla and Elon Musk. This is one of the things he's done that's very, very smart. It, on the Model 3, are you, everyone here familiar with the Model 3 Tesla? The Model 3 Tesla has 73 stamped or machine parts to make the rear under, undercarriage of the car. So from the back seat to the rear bumper, there's about 73 metal parts of various sizes that are welded together, bonded, riveted, whatever it is, to make that whole undercarriage of the car. 73 parts. And that's typical in the auto industry. 
and he decided, why do we have to have 73 parts? And this has been done now for what, 50, 70 years? It's not, it's, that's the way it's always been done. So he wants to have it one part, one part, 73 part. The whole rear of the car, underneath the seats, which is maybe this big, one part. The cast It's never been done before. Mm -hmm. Because he wants that no, two, one in the front and one in the back. One in, yeah, one in the front and one in the back. He wants that one part. Why? Number one, it's less <laughs> costly. Number two, how many robots and how much floor space in the factory does it take for 73 parts to be put together? First of all, you've got to design 73 parts. Then you have to test 73 parts. Then you have to either build them or you have to buy them. I think it was like 300. He said then when it comes yeah. in to the factory, it takes 300 robots at $80,000 a robot, 50000 for the robot, 30000 the program. And then you have to maintain it because those machines need maintenance and they need electricity. And he saved something like 300 linear feet in the factory. Now figure out how many square feet that is or square meters of factory space for 300 robots. So he finds a company in Italy, IDRA, I-D-R-A, which makes these big casting machines. And they go, oh, we don't make a casting machine that big. Well, it turned out they were uh, for the first time. 6,000 ton casting machine, never been done before. He not only buys one to try out, he buys their, all of their, per they, only, they can only make 10 or 12 a year. So he buys three years worth of their production. They're the only company that makes it. So now he's, he's made the underbody of the Model 3 is now what they call a moat. It's preventing this technology and by him buying all the production quantity or production capacity of the, of the supplier in Italy for three years, nobody else can do it. And he's reducing the cost by $200 a car. That you know, may not sound like much to you when you're spending $40,000 or $50,000 to buy a car, but when you're designing a car, if you can save two cents on a car, that's a big deal. $400? <clears throat> 200 just for the rear subassembly. So he's created a way from manufacturing to prevent competitors from competing with them. So when people say, oh, don't worry, Mercedes, BMW, Ford, GM, they'll all catch up, Toyota. They're not catching three up. Three years. <laughs> because he's already locked them out for three years. And, and, and now he's doing it for the front assembly. He wants it to be one piece. So when you got the front and the back assemblies cost reduced and nobody else can do it because nobody else can buy that machine and, and somebody could say, well, another factory will start building it. No, the, the, that technology is new. It's going to take several years for a new company to be able to do that, probably five to ten years. So he's got a three to ten year lead just because of his manufacturing technology. And that, time. that is a big deal. No, I'm not trying to get you to buy stock in Tesla, but I want you to appreciate what he's done. He's using manufacturing as a marketing advantage. All right, now here's something else. That, here's another, you know, we talked about reducing floor space, getting rid of all the robots, not having to buy 73 parts. There's something else. When you have one piece and it's in a, it's in, it's in a mold, it's being made in a mold, the tolerance variation from car to car is tiny. They're all made the same because it's in a mold. That's a precision mold. When you're welding 73 parts together, welding is not a precise thing. And I, I took a welding class. And I can tell you firsthand, when you're trying to put two parts together, and if somebody says, I want you to put those two parts together with a plus or minus 10 thousandths tolerance, it's not going to happen. Not, not, not if you're welding it by hand because the parts themselves have a tolerance. Then when you put them together, you got a welding tolerance. Well, he's making a one part. So now when he mounts all the brake lines and the wheels and the axles and the motors and everything else gets mounted to that precision rear under, uh, underbody, 
Everything is exactly where it's supposed to be. It's not, well, on this car it's a little bit here, and on this car it's a little bit here because of just the tolerances of putting everything together. He doesn't have any tolerances, it's very tiny. And the welding time. Well, yeah, but I'm talking about now when you're assembling the car, your finished product is better because he spent $20 million for each one of these machines. Now, if you, the, the reason the other car companies have never done this in the past is because they couldn't get past finance. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hammer on finance a little <clears throat> when we get to them, and this is kind of part of it. Finance says, oh, that won't pay back in one year or two years. Uh, that machine is $20 million. Are you going to save enough $200 per car? Are we building enough cars in one year? No, you're not building enough cars in one year to pay it back, but you're preventing your competitors from even approaching you. They won't be able to compete with you. You're going to take sales away from them. You're going to eventually put some of them out of business. So see, it's... You have to do a return on investment that is not, I'm jumping ahead actually. You have to do a return on investment that's not just about how is the payback in one year. Don't look at it like that alone. That's one of your pieces of uh, analysis, but it's not all of it. So I'll, I'll give you more on that when we get to finance. Am I done here? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty much done. Okay, so industrial and sanitation. Now, I kind of put these together, but they're, they're really separate. But for the benefit of this show, well, how's our time, by the way? 8.30. 8.30, we started. To Sounds seven, pretty good. So it's about an hour. Yeah, I, I want to finish before 90 minutes, and we're going to easily make it. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I put these together only, only because this is supposed to be a general overview. Industrial engineering worries about how much labor does it take to make that assembly? Uh, what are the ergonomics involved? And safety also gets involved in the ergonomics. And the word ergonomics means how does the human body use a tool to make something? You know, you don't want to use a big heavy drill like this where it weighs 100 pounds and you have to drill a hole and you're, you're, that won't work. You want to have something where if you're talking about a drill, you want it to be something you just pull it down from the ceiling so that the weight of the drill is being supported by the ceiling and you just make your drill hole. Something like that. It's got to be simple. It's got to be easy. You never want to, if you're assembling something on a table, you don't want to assemble it from underneath. You don't want to have to turn it over. You want everything to be top down to make it easy to assemble. So these are part of what industrial engineering and safety engineering uh, are concerned about. Safety engineering is, you know, do you have, is there something combustible in your factory? Is something going to burn? If so, you got to prevent that, and you got to make sure that you have fire extinguishers. So it's, those are the kinds of things safety engineering would be worried about. You don't want to have a robot arm hit one of your workers. You got to have fencing. You gotta have proper lighting. All these are things that industrial engineering and safety engineering are concerned with. So, all right, so we talked about building the production facility, responsible for the man-machine interface, which part of that is ergonomics, determines factory staffing. We covered that now and earlier. Training needs, now, oh, we didn't talk about training. You gotta make sure your people are trained properly. And now, I'm not just talking about the factory workers, I'm also talking about your design team. Your design team has to be trained to know how to work as a design team. You don't want to have the engine designer saying, oh, it's your problem if the transmission doesn't work with our engine. That, they need training. They have to be trained to understand that that's not the right approach. You've got to work as a team. So there's a lot of training in terms of the design team, and then there's a lot of training in terms of your production workers have to know their job. I mean, if the production worker doesn't know how to use a screwdriver, and they have to use a screwdriver to assemble something, then they either better be trained to learn how to use a screwdriver, or you better find somebody else. Uh, industrial engineering also does a lot of determining queue time and cycle times. Now, let's start with cycle time. Cycle time is how long it takes something to be done. 
So if it takes a robot 30 seconds to do a, welding, a, a weld, then that's its cycle time. Q time is how long is it waiting in between each time it does a weld? Because you've got to move the, the, the assembly line, the product has to move. So when this car gets its weld from that robot, then it moves forward, and then the other one comes into place, the next car, and then that one gets welded. How much time is this that you have sitting there waiting? And then you have to know your labor hours and your overall costs. Now, I talked about this earlier when I discussed with you the project engineer and I think the manufacturing and producibility engineers. They're all working this problem. They're working as a team together. It's not just one person, and that's why it's being repeated. They all see it from a different angle. So you want all of those perspectives. And then safety engineering, you want to avoid repetitive use injuries. So if you have to, if it's a bad design and, and the, assemble, the, the designers made a bad design and it forced the worker to put their arm inside of this assembly that they're building and do that, if you have to do that 100 or 500 times a day, you're going to have repetitive use injury on your wrist. The safety engineers and industrial engineers look for those kinds of things and they have to go back to the design engineers. Hopefully they catch it during the design and not later when it's in production because that's too late. The design engineers might say, well, it's already designed. It'll take us $10 million to go back and change it. And then when they redesign it, then you have to go back and redesign the factory. It's better to catch those issues during the design and work closely with human resources. Why? Because you've got to hire people, factory staffing, and training. So you've got to work with human resources to get the right people so that you can train them and staff the factory properly. Next. Can we stop for a sec? Okay, go ahead. Are you halfway through or uh, more? I think, no, I think we're about three quarters of the way. Okay. Can we give them a small break so they can sure. refresh those who want to go to the restroom? Can we take 10 minutes break? Uh, men's uh, restroom is fourth floor, women's restroom is here. Those of you who came late, there are some refreshments outside. Yeah, by the way, 10, stand, uh, ten minutes standard, not Armenian 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, right now it is... Are you going to be Let's get started. Let's get started. Nach Paris, Gaza, Shadurachem Rosh Is it still recording? This. Uremen Baron Kanarin Patsadrats. Sink Ilexian Atkan Arjekavore. Yeti Guzink Adiga Korza Tren. Vidi desnak vorkan barte. Zanazan masnake neru ber kuchunu unink. Aravel irens regavara. Uremen AESA ishnoriv baron kevork ajermianin. In inke dun dramatraze. Hayas tanu. Hayas inke nora garuits dun. Vor ad ingeniere vor guze yertal ad der khorurta gan guze ashkhadir ad hnaravor chunere gan aravel aesa otanavi domsa dalisa you understand what I mean? No. I wanted the 5 or 10%. Okay. Economy class. Thanks to Mr. Kibur Ajemian. We have now an apartment brand new in a brand new building. Two bedroom with two bathrooms with balcony and other facilities. Free for charge for any Armenian engineer who is interested in implementing some of these uh, steps, or he is a specialist in one of these steps. Uh, 
uh, I can talk on the behalf of some other investors that they are also willing to pay him reasonable salaries. Not American style, but top notch uh, Armenian style salaries, like better than a programmer. So if you are interested, if you have an engineer, uh, somebody uh, related to you, Paragam Azgagan Khanami, or Adesak Panerumech Hedakar Karbadze, you cannot learn this from a book. This is, uh, he, uh, he distilled to us experience that spans over three decades, if I'm not mistaken. So, this is the way to victory. This is the way to produce something of quality. You know? Uh, that's number one. I want you to keep that in mind. Uh, Baron Nersesian said something very accurate because he follows this, he works for the Navy, and he said this is a, the most ideal situation. Even American big corporations struggle with it. It's not an easy thing, but when we want to emulate, we want to copy, we want to copy the best product. We don't go copy some Bengali, Pakistani product. Okay? <clears throat> That's number one. Okay. I'm glad you liked it. My students like the Bengali, Pakistani thing. Uh, can, I, can I say a joke? It's actual. So, I teach physics in this place. And years ago, you know, computers were, were in. And we had pretty nice uh, sensors, you know, photo gates and other things. So the, every two students would do a project and somebody, and somebody has to put a report. And this report is simple, just two, three pages. And I just put the steps they have to fill in the data they collected. I go and each report is better than the other whether the language, whether the design, whether the picture, whether the art. I was impressed. I mean, I, could, I don't have the patience to do such a report. And then I reached there, and there was this semi-blonde, dirty blonde girl, you know, sitting there. And I looked at, at her report, and she said, and I said, where's your report? She showed me two pages, there was like sauce on them, handwritten, no graphs, no pictures. I said, what is this, a Turkish report? And she said, she looked at me, she said, I am Turkish. <laughs> really? <laughs> now, I said, I meant to say Kurdish. Oh, but no. I am half Turkish, half <laughs> Kurdish. <laughs> <laughs> this, but her dad happens to be a top physics professor at Caltech. Her dad? Her dad. She had zero interest in physics. But if I tell you that girl memorizes Shakespeare, and when she goes on stage, we used to have a Shakespearean month. So you have to do it, you know, with that with the English language, oh, yeah. with the dress. She was unbelievable. So I wanted to, you know, uh, I said, I've never seen a, such a good Shakespearean performance. She looked at me. I, she never liked me. She hated my guts. Whatever I tried to give her a compliment, the only thing I get is shaking heads. Now, Let's move to a, a second topic. Well, first of all, did, was there a lawsuit because of what you said to us? <laughs> <laughs> the silence. <laughs> anyway. Uh, second thing, there is something very, very important happening. And I want Baron Razmi Garakhanian to talk about it for two, three minutes. Why, how do I tie what Mr. Rarahanian is going to present with what Mr. Kunar has uh, suggested and 
you know, educated us about. Because this is millions of dollars. You know, he talked about robots that are multi-million dollar in a facility that is going to be multi-million dollar. He's talking about uh, <coughs> salaries for engineers that is going to be maybe the biggest, biggest, biggest drain on, on the... So, <coughs> Armenia needs support nowadays. We know that. They need support, brain power, management, and uh, many other things that we in diaspora can do. Besides sending the two, three hundred dollars, we are for Azerinir, Artin, Sahmana, and Sam. You know that? That last minute uh, thing will not help. There's an organization called High ID. Actually, I am one of the founders. Uh, <coughs> Aram Dermar de Rossia, Razmi, and we are about uh, Levon Toros, who's following us. And uh, we're about nine people. Uh, and thanks to Aram and the uh, people who are in Vanadzor, uh, <coughs> they are putting it, uh, the, the structure. Actually, I think I have my ID here. And they issue you this ID. Pass it around. Uh, very important organization. It's an infant. Norad Bes Manu Mani. Baron Arahanian, I talk too much. Come. No, you were doing fine. You should carry on. Uh, okay. You should carry on. Uh, so, the purpose of this organization is to unite. It's not, never been done. It's like this project, never been done on, to, on this level in Armenia. Kennedy said, we want to go to the moon because it's a difficult choice. It's something that had never been done. There's not glory or pride in things you do that everybody does on a routine. Koya Develu Harze. So, this I, uh, the idea is we create uh, chapters everywhere Armenians are, whether it's in Moscow, Krasnodar, uh, Paris, Lyon, Hamburg, you name it. Michin Arvelki Mech, and they will elect re their representatives. Their representatives would, uh, you know, would start representing the Armenian community because there are more than 4,000 Armenian organizations. Some of these organizations are two, three people, and some of these organizations are multi-thousand. We have this card that is circulating around. Eventually, this card will be also a discount card. Now, as you know, a parliament has the power of the purse, as we say in English. Uh, we have, when you use you this card, let's say, Mercedes Knetzir, Gam Rolls Royce Knetzir, Gam Tun Jones Katzir, Gam Tun Aeroflot of Ticket Arir. We try to get, this is Aram's heroic undertaking, and Baron, uh, 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 there are other people, I don't want to mention them, you can check our, uh, and there will be a discount. So we will have certain budgets. With these certain budgets, we can go and help Armenia. Whether if there are a bunch of smart engineers, they want to start a new project or some schools, some clinics, and you name it, you know? Uh, so <clears throat> this is what HiD is all about. Uh, dedicated people we have who work tirelessly hours and hours and hours and we have uh, a leader from the chapter in Glendale is <coughs> Baron Kevork Ajemian for example Baron Gudukian uh, senior uh, Mr. Gudukian's dad is also joining and we have hundreds of Armenians joining 
So I want you to not only to join, I want you to encourage other people to join. Uh, me ask, You know, Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll give the floor back to Mr. Kanar. If, our, if there are any other questions regarding this issue, Baron Razmin, who is the Tanur Kardovarni, Mir Hoka Parsutun Board BOT. Board of Trustees. He will be, I think, in a better position to answer these questions than me. Thank you. Okay, getting back to new, new product, new product design in Armenia. Quality assurance. Okay, maintains ISO 9000 or, or and or AS9100 quality management systems. Now, these quality systems, this is the International Standards Organization, which is headquartered in Switzerland. Uh, I don't even know where AS9100 is. I think this is American. These two are quality systems. It's basically a rule book of how to run your company in a professional manner. It's like, do you have design reviews when you're designing your product? That's one of the rules, is you have to have design reviews. Do you have drawings that are maintained properly to revision level? That's, these have requirements for that. AS9100 has actually more requirements than ISO 9000 in terms of they, they require that before you put something into production that you have 30, 50, or 100 units that are built in the beginning that you build them and you test them in detail before you go to production to drive out any problems before you go to production. So there's a lot of statistical process control and statistical analysis done. And I didn't even put that into this report. But you'll have, you should have a, a statistician on your staff, which is typically a mathematician, <clears throat> to do the analysis. So these are, these are the rules of how to run a company properly and how to document things. And quality assurance is responsible that the company is following it. So it's, it's like an umpire in a baseball game making sure the players are playing the game according to the rules and the umpires have the rules. Quality assurance is the umpire. Review specification documents. All right, so here's all the different kinds of documents, and I've already talked about probably everything except maybe contracts already. But quality assurance is reviewing these things to make sure there's no mistakes and that things are being done per these rules. Contracts. <coughs> I've run into problems where the contract isn't written right. So you're trying to design to the contract, but the contract is wrong. It's got a mistake in it. I mean, literally a mistake. Somebody's got to find those mistakes, and it's better to find them before you sign the contract rather than after you sign the contract. But if it's found after you sign the contract, it has to be fixed or you're going to have a failure. So these are the kinds of things that have to be done by quality assurance. Next slide. Here's some of the things that quality assurance would be involved in, although you may have an expert in this. A strong background in Six Sigma. For the engineers, you probably know what Six Sigma is. So the, the strict definition of Six Sigma is 3.4 defects per million or less. And so you say, well, gee, that's not very many defects. In a, in a million operations, you only have 3.4 per million. Well, it turns out that that's not as good as you think it is, because if you're firing a cannon, and if you have 3.4 defects per million cannon shells, you're going to have a bunch of dead crewmen, because when the cannon or the shell is defective, the gun blows up and the, kill, the crew is killed. 
And how do I know this? Because I was working on a team where they had defects in ammunition and 3.4 defects per million was the maximum amount that was allowed and they wanted it even less than that. And so you'd have to develop techniques when you're manufacturing your product so that you drive out all the possible variations and all the possible problems so you don't have a defect. And I, I was involved in testing where we had defects twice in the testing. And I'm telling you, when you, when you fire a gun and the, and the shell doesn't come out of the barrel of the cannon, it's hot inside the barrel and it can explode at any time because <clears throat> the primer has been hit. And you should see, now I'm far back so I'm relatively safe, although I'm still in the vicinity. But you should see, I, I saw the Marines uh, firsthand. They knew exactly what to do. They were so highly trained that when they, they call out a misfire or a hang fire. When you pull the lanyard and that gun doesn't fire, you've got a hot round in the gun. It could explode at any time in the gun and kill everybody in the vicinity. So as soon as they yell hang fire, the officer yells hang fire, everybody dives for their trenches in the, in the holes in the trench. And then one person is designated to come out of the trench to get that hot round out of the barrel. And the officer and the, the crew determines when that's going to happen safely. And then that person has to go there, not knowing whether that gun's going to blow up and get the job done. Oh, yeah. Now, I tell you this because I actually <laughs> saw it happen. There was a hang fire. I saw it happen because they were doing my test. <clears throat> and the crew knew exactly what to do. Why? Highly trained. Everybody knew their job. And they knew the first thing when the officer yelled hang fire, they knew the first thing was dive into the trench for safety. And then recover, kind of peek up, talk to each other, figure out when to go, send the, the one designated person to go open the gun up and, and fix the problem. So <clears throat> the training is a big deal. You gotta have that hierarchy. And uh, part of that is Six Sigma. Now, statistical process control. This is to reduce process variability reduction. You don't want to make 10 cars that are all supposed to be the same model and they all drive different. Why would they drive different? Well, we talked about it. All those 73 parts in each car get welded together and they're all a little different. So when you put all other parts on them, it's all a little different. You don't want that. You want to make sure that every vehicle is the same. And the best way to do that is to use the mathematical analysis along with that. The mathematical analysis was used by Elon Musk to figure out that I want that $20 million machine that's made in Italy to drive out all of those variations in welding 73 parts together. See, this is part of the analysis that was done to justify buying that $20 million machine. Finance doesn't understand that because these are, you know, science and technology and mathematics uh, involved in this stuff. So these techniques have to be addressed and done, and then finance has to be, it has to be properly explained to finance. And so when we get to finance, I'm going to go through that. All right, now, quality assurance maintains the documents with the key metrics for scrap and rework. You want to find out how well you're doing in terms of your design? Go to the factory floor and see how much scrap and rework there is. If there's a lot of scrap and rework, that means somebody didn't design it right because there shouldn't be any scrap and rework. All right, does everybody know scrap is, it's so bad you just throw it away. You built it, it doesn't work, you can't fix it, you throw it away. Rework means, well, it doesn't work, but I can fix it. Now the question is, can you fix it cheaply, or are you going to fix it and it's going to cost more than building a new one from scratch? If it costs more than building a new one from scratch, you probably want to throw it away anyway. <clears throat> These are the things that have to be measured, because once you're in the factory, you want to make sure that these are very close to zero as much as possible, because this is one causing your costs to go up. Two, some of these defects might end up going to the customer because maybe nobody found it after you built it. 
And if you have enough scrap and rework, you're going to have late deliveries. So you have a lot of problems when you don't address scrap and rework. That's why it's better to do the design thoroughly in the beginning, do all your testing properly in the beginning, to minimize scrap and rework in the factory. Because in the factory, their scrap and rework is expensive. So I'm going to give you an example. On the M1 main battle tank in the 1980s, there was a team of engineers that went and analyzed how much is it, when you have a $1 bolt, a bolt this big, a $1 bolt, if it's made wrong, and you, you find that bolt before it gets put on the tank, before it gets put on the tank, it's on, it's on the assembly line, and somebody realizes for some reason these bolts are defective, we're not going to use them. Well, they're a dollar each, so you wasted a dollar each and whatever the cost of procuring it is. <coughs> if that bolt gets put on the tank, and then it's found at the end of the production line that that bolt is defective, it could cost ten or a hundred or a thousand dollars to rework it and take it out. But if that bolt is buried deep inside the tank, you might have to take off the tracks and this and that, and you've got a big cost involved. If that bolt is defective when the tank goes out onto the test range and they're training tank crews and the tank breaks down, it costs about $10,000 to send a tank recovery vehicle out in the field to go bring the tank back. Because tank recovery vehicles are typically tanks without the cannon on top. So you got an expensive vehicle to go get a tank and bring it back. That's not an easy job because tanks weigh 65 tons and you're out in the mud usually. If that tank goes into battle and that bolt causes a malfunction, the tank is destroyed and the crew is killed and maybe the war is lost. And maybe some of that happened in Armenia in the last war. It's right? not effective equipment. It's, yeah, it's, it's exponential. The the it's exponential. <coughs> you can, it, it's factors of 10. Every step of the way, that $1 bolt by 10, 10, 10, it gets more and more expensive. That, if you lose the battle, how much did that cost because of the $1 bolt? And all the tanks have it, they all have the same defect, and a bunch of tanks could get wiped out in one battle. So that's why you've got to prevent scrap and rework in the design phase and in your testing. Not wait until the product is built and then it breaks down in the field. Now, how many people buy a new car and then a week later their car is back in the shop? Brand new car, it's back in the shop. They didn't do this right. They didn't, basically they didn't follow my whole presentation, right? They didn't, their design team failed when they do, the, when they have these kind of problems. All right, quality assurance segregates and determines disposition of discrepant materials. When you find defects anywhere, whether it's in the factory or it's in the design team, because the design team is going to be building prototypes. So if they find something that's discrepant and not made, you know, let's say you bought something from a supplier and it's not made right, quality assurance is responsible for getting that hardware out of the laboratory. You don't want that in the lab and you don't want the engineers using it because you already know it's defective. So why are you using it? Responsible for inspection, responsible for quality audits. All right, well, this is, quality assurance doesn't do it, but they have inspectors. In, your inspectors will be looking at things, trying to figure out where there's a problem. You don't want inspection to be your quality. In other words, oh, we know there's going to be defects. The inspectors will find it and pull it out. That's too late. That's the wrong way to do it. You don't inspect in quality. Quality is you design it in when you have your design team. You do it right in the beginning. Not expect the inspectors to find all those bolts before they go on the tank. It's too late. Some of those bolts probably are on the tanks. And then you don't know which ones are good and which ones are bad. Last one is responsible for quality audits. You have to make sure that people are, well, it was on the previous one. When I talked about ISO 9000 and AS9100, you have to have audits done to make sure people are following the rules and doing things right. Does random inspection catch that usually? Random inspection is almost useless. Uh, hmm. In aerospace, I forgot the term for random inspection. It's, uh, 
they'll, they'll have you uh, they'll have you test five out of a hundred, and if the five pass, then the other ninety five percent are considered good. There's no there's really no statistical evidence that the other 95 are going to be good just because you pick five randomly and they, they passed. The other 95 could all be bad. But this was typically done in the aerospace industry when I was working in, in the aerospace industry. And it's really a band-aid. It shouldn't be done. But that's what they did. And I think I, it probably started during World War II because they were in such a hurry to build equipment. But we shouldn't be doing that now. We should be doing prevention using Six Sigma techniques, which is reduced process variation and statistical process control. Next. All right, supply chain. Now, supply chain are the people who actually procure what needs to be procured. What, you know, if you say uh, you, you're a car company, Car companies don't make the tires, they buy them. So if it's Mercedes or General Motors Ford, they buy Michelin, they buy Bridgestone, they don't build their own tires. So you have people who are experts in writing up contracts and purchasing. Now, you also have some assemblies that are uh, specific to your product. It's not generic like a car tire. You know, and so the engineers usually have to go out when they design something, they say, all right, we're not going to build this in, in our factory. I'll find a supplier to do it. Maybe a, a supplier has a special machine or a certain uh, specialty to make that. So the engineer goes out and finds a supplier to do it. Next thing you know, the engineer is, is negotiating the price to build five of them. Well, that's a no-no. That's the engineer has no official authority by the company to negotiate a contract. The only person in supply chain management that can negotiate a contract is supply chain management. They are the only procurement agent for suppliers. That's a big problem. You have a lot of engineers going out and finding a supplier, and then they decide, I like the supplier, they can make the thing that I designed, and they're promising the company, I'm gonna, we're going to make 10,000 units, I'm going to have you be the supplier. They can't make that decision. That's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Don't let the engineers start negotiating contracts with suppliers. The only thing the engineer can do is go back to supply chain and back to the program manager and say, I'd like to use this company, but then the the project team, the project program manager, supply chain, and other people, they decide if, the, if they're going to put it out for bid and have maybe, maybe there's five other companies that can do it better. No, but the engineer doesn't know that. The engineer found one, liked that one, and decided wanted to work with that one. So this is a problem because the engineer may not have picked the best company and may not have picked the best company that will provide the lowest price and the highest quality and the right delivery schedule. So don't allow the engineers to go and do the negotiating. That's wrong. And that does not meet ISO 9000 or AS9100 requirements. The supply chain management is the only procurement agent for outside procurement. Supply chain identifies suppliers and supply chain for components and subassemblies. So you're looking for, a, looking for, let's say you're looking for a diode or an inductor or a circuit card steel part, aluminum part, cast part, machine part. These are all components. You might want a subassembly. In a car, a subassembly would be an alternator or a radiator. Those are subassemblies. So these are things that the supply chain management should have expertise in to find you a handful of potential suppliers so that the engineers can go to those suppliers and see which one they'd like to use. The supply chain will recommend making or buying opportunities. Now they don't make or now make or buy means are we going to build this in, in our factory or are we going to buy it? Supply chain doesn't make the final decision, but they are deeply involved in that final decision. You have program management, you'll have design engineers, you'll have systems engineers, you might have quality assurance. They're all involved to decide which one is best. Finance will be involved. 
but don't buy it. Don't let finance sway you to buy it because it's the lowest price. Because if it's the poorest quality, it'll cost you more in the long run. Identify strategic suppliers. Now what does that mean? A strategic supplier is someone who makes something that you deem extremely important for the success of your product. Guess what? Elon Musk considers Idra, the, the Italian company that makes the $20 million, 6,000 ton casting machine, that is a strategic supplier because that prevents by them buying all of their production capacity for the next three years, that gives them a huge advantage over their competitors. Doesn't matter which car company. You, you pick the car company, they won't be able to buy it because that's the only company that makes it and they're already sold out. Strategic supplier. Develops contracts for suppliers. All right, every time you buy something from a supplier, you're gonna have to have a contract. You want that contract written so that if something goes wrong, you have some way of penalizing the person who sold you a defective product or maybe they delivered them. So that has to be done by a professional, either in supply chain, working with contracts. Coordinates supplier delivery schedules. Remember I was talking to you earlier about bill, uh, the bill of material and the line of balance? They have to know what the line of balance is so that they can order the parts or sub-assemblies from the suppliers so that they all reach the assembly line at the same time so that they can be used properly. So you don't want to pay for something that you're not going to use for six months. You wouldn't buy a car, and let's say you go buy a new car, you want to use it as soon as you buy it and it gets delivered. You don't buy a new car and then let it sit in your garage for six months because you could have used that money for something else for six months and you're paying interest on it. It's the same thing here. You want the deliveries to line up with, with the need in the factory. It doesn't have to be in the factory. You also want it to line up when you're building the prototype, or when the design team is building the prototypes. You want the parts to show up at the right time. Coordinate service contracts. <coughs> okay, let's say you don't have an expert in statistical process control. And you need that because you want to reduce the variability of your design, reduce problems. So you've got to hire a consultant. So you find the right consultant and then supply chain, working with contract people, will coordinate the service contracts. Next. So I have a question Go ahead. Um, regarding supply chain. Now, I come across this issue quite often. Uh, the buyers don't really know uh, whom to reach out to for a certain kind of part. Right. Whose responsibility is that? To know that because I might reach out and I find this part from analog devices and I say I want this one now sure enough there might be five other ones that are good uh, I just happen to not know about those right and the buyer usually comes back and says hey uh, who else should I do a common bid with because you know we have to follow the FAR regulations right. I work at North Grumman FAR is federal acquisition regulation yeah well, they come back to me and say, well, we need to do a like-to-like -like bid. Who else should we ask? And I'm like, well, all right, do linear technologies. And then I have to go to the research to find a part from there. So, mm -hmm. so you brought up an interesting uh, situation here is because um, you did mention that supply chain is supposed to do all that work or, or they're responsible. But, but, but not, that, not in a vacuum. Okay, so, it's part so of you're, a, you're the engineer going through the supply chain and saying, I found this part, and they're saying, well, federal acquisition requires that we have competition and that we send it out for bid. Yeah. All right. So, so is your question that you don't know any other companies and, and, and the buyer is saying that the buyer doesn't know any other companies? Yeah, so... Okay, well, this now is luckily, because we have the internet, that problem is pretty easy right now. Yeah. Because you use the internet. If you need a specific integrated circuit, you put in all the words in there that explain what, the, what that integrated circuit is that you want, the specific one you want. And of course, you'll find that on the internet. It was harder back in the 1980s and 90s before the internet became common. 
Then it was harder because the engineer says, well, I don't know either who to go to. And the buyer isn't even technical. The buyer is usually. Yeah. Buyers, tip, there's two kinds of buyers. The ones that are especially trained in, in federal procurement, which is a nine-month program, and I think you can take it at UCLA or somewhere. It's a nine-month specifically to procure product for the federal government. And then, then people might have degrees in English or business administration. They're not technical. It's the engineer's responsibility to find more than one supplier because you don't want to, just because you found one you like doesn't mean you want to get stuck with that one. Maybe that's not the right one for you. Or maybe there's a lower cost one that's higher quality. You don't know. So would savvy engineers then, knowing this, instead of finding the one they like, get ABC and say, I really want this one, here are the runner-ups, and submit that all as a package to... Uh, okay, so that's the second part that I wanted to address. You can do that, but it's not enough. That's the start. No, no, you, you started right, but you got to finish it. When you say, I found three companies, but this is the one I want, you got to justify it. And when I was doing that, I could justify it. And it requires you to, at least in this country, to write English language very well. If you understand what they're looking for, you have to justify it on cost. You have to justify it on performance. You have to justify it on delivery schedule. You have to justify it because that company is highly reliable compared to the other companies. You gotta have a reason. If, if, uh, if there's an American company and there's a Chinese company, and if they're equal, you want the American company because you don't know what's gonna happen in China. There's a lot of problems in China now. All right, so there's, you have to have a justification, so you have to write a report. When I used to do the reports, I would always get what I wanted because I put the effort into writing it in detail. Most engineers don't like to write, so they don't write a good justification of why they want that part from that company, and it gets rejected by supply chain, not production control, but supply chain, the supply chain manager will reject it because it doesn't meet the federal acquisition requirements, justification requirements. And you get rejected and you go, oh, they rejected it and now I have to use a part that I don't want. Wrong. You didn't write a good enough justification. That's your responsibility, not supply chain. They'll do what you want if you justify it properly. When I had those opportunities, I justified it and I got what I wanted. And it made supply chain happy because they're off the hook. They go, look, if federal acquisition does an audit on me or if quality assurance comes and does an audit, I just show them I purchase it because it was justified properly. So you got to write proper English if you're in this country to justify it properly, meet all the requirements, cost, quality, schedule, and sometimes sourcing location, like which country is it coming from? If it's coming from, in quotes, enemy, you don't want to buy it from them. Is that? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we talked about this earlier. Let's see, where am I now? Where is this? Okay, production control. Determines production volume to meet top level delivery schedule. I think we, we talked about this earlier. These are the people who control what goes on on the factory floor. The same thing happens when you're on a design team because you're buying parts because you're going to build prototypes to make sure your design works. So you have to have, you have, to have a production control person to, to do this, to make sure that you're bringing in all the parts at the right time and making sure the engineers and the technicians are building it all up to, to build your prototypes. Assures adequate numbers of components and supplements. You got you, look if if you're building five prototypes and you only got enough parts for three of them, then you're only going to build three prototypes. Somebody's got to make sure that all the parts are showing up, and that's production control. You want to make sure it's safely stored near where you're building it. You don't want to have it in a building a half a mile away because things get lost, and then somebody's got to go to the building and then walk over and bring it over, or bring it in a car. It becomes a headache. Try to make it close to where you're going to do the assembly. Cooperates with supply chain and suppliers and assure adequate deliveries. Well, that's all kind of the same. 
reports to quality assurance any discrepant material. We talked about that earlier. About <clears throat> you got to have it in a to follow the rules of ISO 9000 and AS 9100. The rules you got to have it in a fenced or gated area. If it's not fenced, if it's not gated, and if there's not a lock on the gate, you don't meet the requirements of AS9100 or ISO 9000. Now, I'm, I'm, I got a lot of experience with ISO 9000 because it has about 58 rules of running a company. And I had to write the documents for every one of those 58 rules. So it ended up being about a 200-page rule book. And when you end up writing those, you start seeing how everything kind of overlaps to make sure that the whole goal is to prevent mistakes and to have things done in an efficient and effective manner. And if you follow the rules, you can get it done. Right? So that's, that's why you have AS9100 and ISO 9000. If I'm a supplier, I want to be able to tell the, the, my customer I follow the rules. I'm ISO 9000 certified, or I'm AS 9100 certified. And that tells the customer, I probably should consider this company over this company because they're certified. They have to go through a registration certification process. Next. Randy, uh, sorry to interrupt. Anybody is interested in having some coffee, Armenian coffee? Hands up. Randy? No. Don't want coffee. No. Okay. Configuration control. All right. This is talking about drawings. When you're talking about configuration, you're talking about are the drawings to the right revision level and do we have all the drawings that we need? So are the drawings safely stored? Now, they could be paper drawings or they could be electronic drawings. It doesn't matter. Now, if you have paper drawings and there's a fire, you're done. Right? Everything burned up. What are you going to do? Tell your customer or your program manager? Or are you going to tell the corporate management? Oh, we had a fire and all the drawings are gone? Who has drawings in 2021? It's all electronic. Well, okay. You have, your drawings are electronic. Power's out. Okay. <clears throat> right? Backups. Or you get a virus and everything is gone. It's the same as a fire. So when people think, oh, if it's electronic, it's safe, no, it isn't. Just remember, if there's one atomic bomb exploded, the, the electromagnetic waves from one atomic bomb are going to wipe out all the computers and everything. They're all going to die. Think about that. Okay. I mean, that's to the extreme, but it's possible. All right. Drawings and drawing summary maintained with revision levels. All right. We've talked about this over and over. This is a big deal. You've got to have this just as much as you've got to have this. If you're using the wrong drawings, you're in trouble. Assure's design team has access to the latest drawing revisions. Best way to do this is you have a centralized computer system where every, every time somebody calls up the drawing for a specific part, that request goes to the main computer memory, which is controlled by configuration control, so that every time you call up a drawing, it always sends you the latest revision. And it also sends you a sheet that tells you it's the latest revision, so that you know the date and the revision letter for that specific drawing. Okay, and then maintains bill of material with input from design engineering. You've got to have your bill of materials so that you know all the parts that are going into that assembly. Next. Finance. I think this is the last one or near the last. All right, now, I'm going to hammer on finance, but I'm also going to say good things about finance. So you're going to hear both sides. Finance is going to be coordinating closely with the program manager and the project engineer because they're going to want to know every week, every month, how much money was spent on labor, how much money was spent on materials, how much money spent on supplies, and anything else that comes up. Consultant special services. Because they have to do their own roll-up of all those costs every week or every month and keep track to know, are we on track? If you've spent, like I said earlier, if you've spent 
50% of the money for the program is 50% of the work done. And if only 20% of the work is done, you know you're in trouble. Right? And then you've got to figure that out. So finance is going to be deeply involved in that because they're going to be taking all this information from different people and summing it all up and saying, well, I don't think we're, I don't think we spent 50%, but I don't think we're at 50% in terms of work done. And so that information goes to the program manager, it goes to the systems engineer, it goes to the whole team, and then they got to figure out what happened and fix it fast before they fail. Because, you know, if you've run out of money before you've finished your product, what do you got? You, you, you're stuck. Then you have to go back to your corporate management, assuming you, your corporate management has money to give you and is willing to give it to you so that you can finish. That's called a cost overrun. And cost overruns don't lead to good products usually. Cost overruns don't do very much for your career future, right? You get fired, you get laid off, or you get into a dead-end job. <clears throat> so here, I just talked about it. Finance develops the cost to completion forecast. So if you're 50% spent and 25% done, that means you're, you're spending $2 for, for every one that you should have, and you're going to be you're going to be over your budget by 100%. So they're going to be doing this analysis. Now, return on investment. This, uh, oh, okay, let's do this one. Reviews submissions for capital equipment. This is almost the same story I told you earlier about when you go to supply chain and you want to justify buying this part over some other part. When you think, when, when they're designing, when the designers are designing the product, they're also thinking about how am I going to build it in the factory? And then like Elon Musk, $20 million for that machine. They did all sorts of return on investment. Now, most companies say you have to pay back the machine in one year. And I think that's really stupid. If the machine will last 10 years, why does it have to pay back in only one? Because most machines, if they're really good machines, like the $20 million casting machine that Elon bought from Idra in Italy, that machine doesn't pay back in one year. It costs $20 million. But if it pays back in two years, and the machine will last 20 years, and it's preventing your competitors from catching up to you, that is a huge strategic advantage. Did anybody put a value on the strategic advantage? It's one thing to put a value on how much money it saves you every car you build. But if it's preventing your competitors from catching up to you, there's value to that. The engineers, when they write their analysis and give it to finance, they only calculate how much did I save on each of those cars. So if you didn't save $20 million in the first year to buy that $20 million casting machine, then finance says, you can't buy it. Is that like a negative opportunity cost? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Elon doesn't think that way, and that's why he's so smart. <clears throat> he says, okay, it doesn't pay back in one year. Maybe it pays back in three years. He says, but I'm preventing my competitors from catching up to me. That's worth a lot of money. I'll have more sales over the long run. So as a result, he, somebody factors that in. How much money is it worth to the company to keep all your competitors behind three years? What's the value of that? In my mind, it's probably worth more than the savings. It's probably worth more than the $200 per car you save. It might be worth $1,000 a car because you're making more sales because you're preventing Mercedes, BMW, Ford, GM from catching up to you. So there, people are going to buy your car. You have more sales. This. Return on, return on investment analysis that's typically done in the U.S. is done wrong. And that's why I want to make a big issue out of it. It's wrong. Elon Musk has the best technique. Now, when I was working in aerospace, I would calculate if we had a better way of doing something by buying a machine and if we could reduce the scrap and the rework and make the product less expensive, See, I'm adding scrap and rework now. If I can reduce scrap and rework, 
And if I can make the product better and faster, but less labor costs, I put all those factors together, and then my return on analysis, return on investment analysis, would, would be less than a year. Most engineers don't put in the scrap and rework costs. A lot of times they say, well, I don't know what it is. I don't know how much it is. I don't know how much it costs. Well, it, you know it's not zero, but that's what you wrote because you didn't write it into your report. If you don't write it into your report, you're saying that the scrap and rework was zero, and you know that's wrong. So make an estimate. You're an engineer. Make an estimate. Make a fair estimate. And I've had engineers tell me, well, if I make an estimate, somebody will say I exaggerated. Make the estimate low enough so that they won't, they won't accuse you of exaggerating. That's how I used to do it. And nobody would argue. And then I hit the return on it, even though it was one year, and even though I didn't like the one year requirement, I'd still meet it. Because I was figuring out all these other things. When you add everything together, you include the scrap, you include the rework, you include all of the overhead costs when you have a failure. And those costs are so big, because when you have a failure, you have to involve the program manager. You have to involve supply chain. All these other people get involved. Put a factor for those people into your return on investment analysis, because they're working on it to solve the problem when you have a failure. The engineers don't do that. They only look at, okay, how much, how much they just look at the basic costs. You gotta look at all the costs and include it. All right, so I'm saying the payback ought to be about three years. If you've got a really good machine like the $20 million casting machine, you better make that payback three years because it's probably worth doing it. And so that's what he's done. That's what Elon has done. All right, invest in the equipment for strategic and tactical advantage. All right, I've already talked about this. This is what Elon has done. The tactical advantage is the cost that he's taken out of the cost of building the car. The strategic advantage is he bought all of the capacity of Idra, the manufacturer of the casting machine, for the next three years. Nobody's going to be able to catch up to him. That's a strategic plan. That was brilliant. This is, if you play chess, this is a brilliant strategy in chess. Okay, avoid short-term cost savings as detriment of production design. Now, you're designing your product, and, and again, the casting machine. If they should have designed the product, when they designed the Model 3, they designed it with the 73 small parts that have to be welded together. Then they went out and bought 300 robots, then they had to put the robots in the factory, they had to program them, they spent all the money. And then somebody figured out, maybe we ought to buy that 6,000 ton casting machine for 20 million. Wouldn't it have been better if they had done that first? Now, in, in the case of Tesla, the machine was new, it wasn't even ready. The machine is ready now. So when they did it four years ago, that machine didn't exist. So they got an excuse. But if that machine had been available four years ago, then they should have designed it in to their manufacturing process and gotten those savings from the very first car that was manufactured. And those first cars would have been built better. Are, are people, are you, do people know what uh, the gaps are on your doors and your hoods? You know, the, the gap between the, the panels, the body panel gaps. Right. That's one way of knowing how good the, the product is on a car. Those are tolerances. That, that's part of the tolerance buildup. Now, four years ago, the Model 3 Teslas were bad. And if you want to look up somebody and learn about manufacturing, look up uh, Monroe Live. M-U-N-R-O, that's his name, Sandy Monroe. Monroe Live is his... He tears cars apart. He reverse engineers cars in Detroit, and he speaks his mind, and he tells you whether your car is junk or not. <laughs> and he, and he, when he first tore apart the Model 3 Tesla four years ago, he said, this car is so bad, it's worse than a 1990s Kia or Honda <laughs> from the 1990s. He considers bolts and screws as now, crutches. Now, <laughs> now. I've known about Sandy Monroe's companies for, for over 30 years, and so when I when somebody came and told me, okay, this guy said this, and it was in the Wall Street Journal, 
I go, you know what? He made a mistake. Now, he's a sharp guy, and I like him. But I told my friend four years ago he made a mistake. I said, I'll bet anything he, he purchased a pre-production vehicle somehow before they ironed out all the bugs in the factory. Now, they shouldn't have built those cars the way they did. They, they were rushing it, right? It's a startup company. It's rushing. Th these are the problems you run into. And these are the problems that I'm telling you about because this is the kind of problems you want to avoid when you're doing a design. They rushed it. So the first, I don't know how many, 50 or 100,000 cars were maybe, maybe less than 50,000. They weren't built very well. Then, last year, he bought another model. Now, he buys his own cars so that he doesn't have to say good things about the product because Tesla didn't give him the car for free. He buys the car on his own dime, then he tears it apart. When he tore apart the second one, four years later, which was last year, and it's all on YouTube, Monroe and Associates, uh, Monroe Live, M-U-N-R-O, not R-O-E. You look at it, and they have a series, he's got a series, I think there were 40, uh, actually it was the Model Y he tore apart. He tore apart the Model Y, which is the follow-on to the Model 3. When he tore the Model Y apart a year ago, he said it was the best car he had ever taken apart. He's been doing this 30 years, and he takes apart everything. For all the different car manufacturers, he'll buy a car and then just tear it apart and say how bad it is or how good it is. He said that's the best car he has ever torn apart. So it went from a really bad car, the Model 3, four years earlier, which was a 1990s Kia, to the best car I've ever reverse engineered. In how many years? Four years. Three to four years. And it turned out I was right. The car he got, the Model 3 got four years ago, turned out was an early production version, which not really fair to, to take that car apart. But they shouldn't have built it. They should have ironed out the bugs before they shipped it. But because it's a startup, that's what they have to do to stay in business or they'd have gone bankrupt. Anyway, the, I'm telling you these stories because I want to relate what I'm showing you here to real life situations that are happening now. Okay, so avoid the short term cost savings at the detriment of product design. If you need that $20 million casting machine because you know it's going to solve a lot of quality problems and it's going to prevent other companies from catching up and it's going to save you money on every car you build, don't worry about whether it meets the one year criteria or not for payback. If it's two or three years, do it anyway because it's the smart thing to do. Reports cost anomalies to program manager. Now sometimes people when they write down how many hours they work, they didn't work that many hours and so eventually Finance, if they're really keeping an eye on things, they're going to find out that somebody's doing something corrupt. And those things need to be found out, and then you've got to take care of the problem. Either, either you find out why the person's doing it, or you terminate it. You've got to do something. You just can't let it keep going. And then coordinates with the program manager and HR regarding bonuses. So you want to have some kind of incentive plan for the company. It's better to incentivize the whole team instead of picking out individuals. Because if you're picking out individuals, can you really pick out the right ones? And if you pick out just a few individuals and give them a bonus, then the other people become depressed, rejected, angry, and they leave. They leave your company. They're mad, they leave. It's better to have finance, work with the program manager, work with human resources, and come up with a plan where you, you're going to have bonuses or some kind of incentive for the whole team if they succeed and meet certain targets. And there should be targets that are numerical, mathematical. Don't just say, oh, it's a good problem. So you didn't put that in because it's near Christmas. <laughs> yeah, this has nothing to do with Christmas. This has to do with, <laughs> with the performance of the team in executing what their plan is. Next. And I, I think this is... Okay, recommend the training. <clears throat> all right, then this is something that is needed by all the people on the design team. First of all, organizational dynamics. You've got to know how to work with people. 
if the engineer, I'm not picking on you, if the engineer doesn't write the document right to request that particular part, then the supply chain person is going to reject it. They have to because they have to follow their rules. So the engineer has to know that so that the engineer does the right thing by writing the request properly. Uh, the, the, the other example uh, we use is the engineer has to understand that they can't go out and talk to a company and start negotiating a contract with them. Only the supply chain people can do the contractual negotiations for the company because they are the only legal agent for the company when the company is buying something. Only the supply chain people can do that. The engineer has to know that. That's part of the organizational dynamics. You know, people have to know what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to react to things. And those are just two examples. There's plenty of others. Concurrent engineering manufacturing process. Everybody needs to know that you have to have a whole team to do engineering properly. And that includes finance, supply chain, quality assurance. It's not just engineering. It's not just manufacturing. Designed to Six Sigma. This is really saying reduce the variability of the product. That's what that's saying. Design the cost. You should have a cost target. So your design has to meet that cost target. Design for manufacturing and assembly. By the way, that's called DFMA. This is what Sandy Monroe, the YouTuber I was talking about, Sandy Monroe is an expert at this and his team. He's got, I think he's talking about having a hundred engineers now, so it's a pretty big Good operation. Iron. By the way, Sandy Monroe is not young. He's 74, 70s. 75 years old. So he's been around 50 years. He's seen everything. And he says it. It's so funny listening to him talk because he just tells you how it is. And he, says, and he doesn't care whether you believe him or not because he says, I've already gone through it. I've lived through it. I know. And he's right. Lean design. Lean design is designing something that's cost effective, very little scrap and rework. It's eliminating waste when you're, when you're building and designing and building your product. Same thing here. Lean design and lean manufacturing go hand in hand. Engineering drawings. I haven't talked too much about this. Now, when, when you're doing your drawing, okay, everything is electronic now. It's all on the computer. It's all computer-aided design. When you're doing your drawings, you got one engineer that got trained 20 years ago <coughs> in the rules of making a drawing. Because there's rules for making drawings. There's a lot of rules. The, the, I got trained in it in 1988, and I, I know it's changed a lot since then. So you got these rules. If you were trained in 1988 and you're using those rules now to make your drawing, and then there's somebody else who's 25 years old and they just got trained last year, their drawing is going to be different than your drawing even though you're drawing the same part. If you told both of them to draw the same part, because they're following different rules, the rule book changes. If you build a custom home in California, every year the California state code for home construction changes. You know, 10 years ago, you didn't have to have sprinklers in your home, right, for fire safety. Now you have to have a sprinkler system. It's the same thing, and this is what I'm referring to here. The rules for making the drawing change every year, every two years, maybe not every year, but every two or three years, they change and they improve the requirements. You've got to make sure everybody's trained to the same requirements. You don't want to have different engineers designing to different drawing requirements because then when they look at it, they're going to read it differently. It's like, you know, you, well, it's like me. I, I learned Western Armenian, then I learned, and I didn't learn it very well, then I learned Eastern Armenian, I didn't learn that very well, and, and now it's, I'm confused sometimes. That's why I said Karnavatsan, and that's the reason. Okay, so it's like that. You don't want to have all the drawings all different. So you gotta, you got to follow one standard. you got to have everybody trained to the right drawing standard. This is a big deal. This <laughs> okay, next. All right, we already talked about statistical process control. you got to have people in quality assurance 
that are good at this because they're going to do the mathematics behind it to calculate everything, and then that gets provided to the project engineer typically. And maybe the project engineer ends up doing the SPC, or maybe someone in quality assurance. But you got to have that because this is crucial to reducing the variation from one product to the next. Prevent reverse, I'm working on this right now for our company. <clears throat> and, and I uh, I told you earlier about, I was at a meeting in Beverly Hills and the guy stood up 10 feet from me and he starts talking about what his product was and it was what I needed to help prevent reverse engineering. All right, so what is reverse engineering? That's one, so, well, it's what Sandy Monroe does, Monroe, uh, Monroe Live. <clears throat> you, somebody gets a hold of your product and they start carefully taking it apart to learn how you designed and built it so that they can either copy it or copy it and then make it better than you. And they didn't put any of the effort that you put in because you did the first one and they just stole it from you somehow. They bought it or stole it. And now they're looking at it and they go, okay, I, I see what they did, we can make it better and because we're copying you, we don't have to spend all the money you did to make the first design. We're just going to steal it and spend a little bit of money and make it better than you. But this is a big deal because when you have a U.S. patent, and I have five of them, and so I know this from personal experience, the first thing, when you go through the patent process at the company I worked for, which was Raytheon, the patent attorneys, who are usually people with degrees in engineering, <coughs> science. They'll say, can this be easily reverse engineered? And if you say yes, and they go, okay, who would do that? And if you say, well, a company's in the U.S., it's not that bad because you can sue them. But if, they, if you say, oh, the Chinese will steal them, or, or <laughs> Vietnam, or Japan, or Korea, or Taiwan, because most of, much of the reverse engineering is done in the Far East. If you say that, they don't, want to, they don't want to patent it because it costs money to patent it and you can't enforce the patent. Remember, when you have a patent, you have to tell everything about how you make your product. Well, then anybody can steal it and reverse engineer it because you told them how to do it. Now, the reason patents are valuable in this country is because in this country, if a U.S. company steals it, you can sue them, and, and that kind of prevents people from typically stealing it in this country, because we have laws in this country and you can sue them. If somebody from a foreign country steals it, all right, if somebody from England steals it, England has a very good legal system, you can sue them in, in, in England or UK. But if you try to do that in foreign countries in the Far East, almost impossible trying to win. And as a result, it becomes a problem for you trying to patent something. You're better off uh, keeping it as a, what's called a trade secret. You keep it as a secret. Because if you keep it as a secret, nobody's ever going to find out. Now, if, you, if your invention is a better manufacturing process, it's almost impossible for you to prove in court that they made it the way you made it. They just made it. You don't know how they made it because you can't go into their factory to see if they copied you in terms of how you made it. Are trade secrets protected under the law? Well, you have to follow the you have to follow the procedure of keeping it a secret. But is there a legal no uh, status for it? I think there is, but it's basically it's a secret. And if the, se if the secret thing. gets out. Yeah. It's got to be from theft or something. Yeah, because yeah, that's like theft. that's like Elon Musk and Tesla suing some of their ex-employees because they've stolen some of the trade secrets and gone to other companies. But it's a hard thing to prove. It's different as compared to having a patent. Now, patents are good when the product is different, not the manufacturing process. Because you can't get into somebody else's factory to see whether they've copied your process or not pretty hard to prove it in court. So there's the best way is, where is it here? The best way is come up with methods to prevent a company from reverse engineering your product. 
Now, what did Elon do? Everybody knows that he put those 73 parts together into one casting, but they can't buy right. the machine. <laughs> that's how he prevented reverse engineering. See, that, that's a good technique. Okay, and then we've already talked about these two, ISO 9000, AS9100. These are things that people <laughs> need to know about on your design team because they've got to follow the rules. And when you want to sell your product to the customer, you want to be able to brag that you follow the rules and you can prove it with documentation in your company. Project management, you don't necessarily need to use Microsoft Project Software, but this is one of the popular ones. But you got to have a way of managing the project and knowing the schedules. Human resources, technical recruiting, you got to be able to hire the right people, you got to know how to interview the right people. And then environmental health and safety, that's talking about how do you protect yourself from getting hurt in your own factory. Next. I think we're done. General recommendations. Overcome the challenges with open, honest, positive discussion. You've got to be able to talk openly about what your problems are so you can solve them. Team members must understand and support each other's interrelated tasks. So the engineer has to understand the issues of supply chain and get rid of the silos. In other words, the engine people can't tell the transmission people, it's our engine. If your transmission doesn't work with our engine, it's your problem. That's, that's a silo. That's like they're just thinking, we're the only ones that are important. Transmission isn't important. It's your problem. You've got to get rid of that attitude. Get rid of the egos. Everybody's got to work together to make it successful. Next. Contract development. You've got to know how to write contracts properly so you don't get burned when you sign a contract with a company and then the contract wasn't written properly and then you have to do things that you don't want to do. Quality assurance, audits and inspection. This goes back to meeting ISO 9000 and AS9100 requirements. You've got to be able to do audits and do inspection so that you meet the requirements. Develop a highly trained production workforce. Supervisors, production staff, maintenance staff. Now, this is later on when you're in production. So, organizational discipline is critical, but it's initiative that leads to success. You gotta have somebody that's driving things to happen. Elon Musk makes things happen. So maybe he breaks the rules sometimes, which he does, but he makes things happen. And so that's, what's, that's what makes the success. And that's it. Any questions? Everybody's tired. Thank you. Are there any questions? Some questions. You spoke so thoroughly that you did not leave a gap for a question. A lot of this is how top companies manufacture stuff, design manufacture stuff in the U.S. Translating this to a post-Soviet nation with all of the attendant challenges, no doubt, would require its own talk to adapt to that. So it's going to take a lot of training. Well, yeah, and taking into account the regional difficulties, and, and we have the luxury of all this supply chain. That's right. Markets. So it would be fascinating to supply chain in Armenia for manufacturing is, is going to be more expensive. The labor is lower, but the other costs are higher. So, yeah, because it's hard to get parts in and out of the country. You got to fly it in, which is expensive. But if you do it really smart, you have a good design team, you can drive a lot of the costs out of your design. Remember I said 80% of the cost of the product is based on the design. So if you have a good design team, they can drive out a lot of that cost. And, and depending on what product it is, you can still manufacture some things in Armenia. You couldn't manufacture a car because it's too big and too heavy and the parts got to come from too many other countries and it's blockaded. Electronics? But electronics are small, lightweight, easier to fly in if you need to buy parts, easy to fly out the finished product because the electronics are It's really dependent on air. Much of it. You can't get it past Turkey. You're not going to go through Azerbaijan. 
Georgia. Iran is a problem because the U.S. has sanctions on Iran. You're going to go through Georgia, and you got to go to Batumi. And then you got to go through the Black Sea. I have a question. So, <clears throat> uh, so uh, we've, we've been using the, well, the classic traditional uh, project management that we call the, now we call it waterfall. And now in the software engineering, we go more to the agile, which is very short periods of time. Is there anything, is that same trend in, uh, in manufacturing also? Or? Well, lean, lean manufacturing, I, I wouldn't call it a trend. Lean manufacturing's been around well, it's always been around because you always want to build something most effectively with, with as little as possible rework and scrap. But now they give it names. You know, the lean manufacturing came out in the 1980s. People say that, I, I, I'm not a big fan of Toyota, I'll tell you that up front. People say that Toyota developed all these things. This stuff was originally developed by Ford in 1910 when he created the assembly line. Then he created the River Rouge facility where they built all the product and it was all vertically integrated right there in one big factory. I've been to the River Rouge. I mean, it's all closed down now, but I've seen it. It's all rusted. <clears throat> so you might think that Toyota invented all this stuff, but in reality, it got invented back with Ford in 1910. We have to give Toyota one thing, they improved on it. The Japanese improved on quality control. Right. Yes, they learned it during World War II. Uh, no, uh, Korean War. Because the Americans wanted to produce weapons close to the Korean uh, battlefield. So they trained the Japanese uh, how to do quality control. And the Japanese are very meticulous. All the Asians are. There is a reason for it. And they overdid the Europeans. Anyway, we can talk to Randy uh, one or two one uh, in a second. But officially, uh, I want to conclude this lecture. And uh, as a thank you, the AESA will give you this and wish you and your great family uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank, thank you very much. Definitely, we would like people like Randy and definitely Randy himself to go to Armenia and work and teach and improve what we can produce there. One thing I want to tell you, my friend, Sir Anuna Hagope, we need to get this out of our mind. In Armenia, we cannot do this. In Armenia, we can do anything we want. Okay? Basharvazik, Basharvatching, meaningless. Yes, as he mentioned, Iran is a problem. Pites, I'm not. Aram, Aram, Gedretir, Gedret. I will garbage of it. No, Chem Trem Gedret. Okay, hold on. Say goodbye. Uh, <laughs> but yeah.